start. Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Omer Gohar, an Associate Professor of Medicine uh, at the University of Louisville here and the Director of Interventional Pulmonology Program. Uh, Dr. Gohar um, uh, did his medical school uh, back in uh, Pakistan, King Edwards Medical College, um, came to the U.S. and uh, did his residency uh, at University of um, Alabama, uh, followed by the fellowship even in the uh, University of Alabama, and he finished in uh, 2009, stayed on uh, faculty for two years there and then decided that he wanted to do an interventional pulmonology fellowship so he went to Ohio State completed his fellowship in 2012 and we were fortunate to recruit him at that time um, when he joined us we didn't really have any interventional program structured and he was instrumental in developing the IP fellowship program we had an IP fellowship and he graduated two fellows from our program got involved with the development of the lung cancer screen at the uh, University of Louisville and collaborated with the uh, thoracic and oncology group here. Um, he's um, very popular among our fellows uh, because, of course, of the interest in IP and received numerous awards as the best faculty from our uh, division. Uh, he received, actually, the award three years in a row. Um, got invited uh, several years to uh, be part of the IP uh, program at Ohio State, uh, and he's also invited guests uh, giving grand rounds at the University of Kentucky. Um, currently, he's uh, been an instrumental in developing the VALT program uh, uh, after performing uh, several trials, and we have right now um, the only uh, program in the state of Kentucky for valve program for end stage COPD and emphysema. So I'm pretty sure the um, house staff is going to enjoy the talk today because it's interesting always when he gives that talk uh, about the uh, advances in diagnosing therapeutic bronchoscopy. So um, I'm going to uh, let him start, uh, but I want to thank him for uh, taking time to. Uh, Give us an update on this uh, topic, uh, Dr. Gohar. Thank you, Dr. Saad, um, and good morning, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, I hope everybody can hear me and see me and see my slides, and I'm hoping that we will not have any audiovisual issues. This is a very new format for me. So the topic of my talk is lights, camera, and action. Um, Oftentimes, when we talk to our patients about bronchoscopy, trying to get consent, we often tell them that we will be putting them to sleep and putting a light and camera down their throat. Uh, but as we will see in this talk, uh, bronchoscopy has become a lot more than just light and camera, and uh, there's a lot more action that we can perform uh, with bronchoscopy, so hence the name. Uh, this is the outline of my talk. I almost always start with a brief historic perspective because it helps us understand how far we have come, uh, where we are going or could go, and also helps us, uh, or it helps us appreciate the, the work, the hard work, the courage, and uh, sacrifice of those who have gone beyond us, uh, uh, before us. Um, to, to say what Einstein said, we stand on the shoulders of giants and we should acknowledge those giants. Um, what I have done is uh, selected the interventions or advancements in interventional pulmonology, the ones that are going to have the most impact uh, in patient care. Obviously, in the last uh, decade or so, there have been multiple advancements in uh, the field of bronchology, uh, both in terms of platforms, uh, software upgrades, and sampling tools, but uh, we cannot cover all of those in this talk. So we will focus on the ones that I believe uh, will have the most impact on patient care. So we'll talk about some advancements in navigation bronchoscopy for pulmonary nodules. Uh, we'll talk about bronchoscopic therapies for obstructive lung disease, uh, including asthma, emphysema, and chronic bronchitis. And then we'll briefly talk about uh, therapeutic bronchoscopy for early stage lung cancer, and then some of the challenges and future directions. Um, so the history of bronchoscopy is actually uh, centuries old. Uh, for centuries, uh, foreign body aspiration and airway obstruction because of tuberculosis or diphtheria 
was a major uh, medical problem and used to be almost always fatal. So for centuries, those inclined towards medicine uh, were thinking about access to airway. And uh, it is said that Hippocrates, uh, the father of medicine, uh, was the first one to uh, introduce the idea of introducing uh, a metal tube in the airway. Uh, we also read the names of Avicenna, uh, Vesalius, and Vesau, uh, who came up with different ideas on how to access the airway. But for centuries, this was uh, just a theory uh, that was not very popular. Uh, to the point where in 1846, Dr. Horace Green introduced the idea of uh, intubation or access to the airway to the New York Academy of Medical Sciences, and this is the reply that he received. Uh, they said, it's a monstrous assumption, ludicrously absurd and physically impossible, an anatomical impossibility and unwarrantable innovation in practical medicine. And Dr. Horace Green was actually expelled from the society for even suggesting uh, such a thing. Uh, interestingly, sometimes when you talk to our patients about bronchoscopy, they more or less uh, share the same feelings, uh, even today. Um, after several decades, uh, perhaps centuries, of thinking about uh, inventing the right instrument, having the right light source, and having local anesthesia, it was Dr. Gustav Killian from Austria, an ENT surgeon, who was the first one to perform uh, bronchoscopy in a patient with tracheostomy. And he also removed the first foreign body, which was an aspirated port bone uh, in 1897. And once he had that instrument, uh, he went on to perform many different uh, related procedures, such as uh, metallic and rubber tubes uh, used as stents. He used fluoroscopy uh, to probe uh, peripheral lesions. He also did bronchography uh, with bismuth powder. Uh, used the bronchoscope to uh, go into the chest as pneumoscopy, um, performed endoluminal radiotherapy, and then some of his pupils also treated tracheal cancer with uh, brachytherapy. Um, so here we see Dr. Killian uh, performing his bronchoscopy in the left screen, and then his suspension letting go bronchoscopy. Uh, so you can appreciate the, the courage, the sacrifice, and hard work of not just the uh, physicians, but also the patients. And uh, this is this is the pre-COVID era, so obviously masks were not a big thing back, back in those days. Um, Dr. Killian was also, a, uh, also an educator, and so he actually introduced this idea to many uh, famous students. Here we have a medical student who's looking through the bronchoscope, uh, looking down the trachea, and the patient, as you can see, is sitting in this chair that used to be called the Killian chair, uh, where they would be almost in a sinking position so their head could be extended and uh, the bronchoscope could be introduced. Now, two of the famous students of Dr. Killian, one of them was Dr. Chevalier Jackson from the United States, who went and learned bronchoscopy uh, from Dr. Killian and brought it to the United States. And uh, Dr. Jackson uh, also, um, made uh, certain modifications in the bronchoscope, such as introducing a suction channel, a uh, light source, and a lot of, a lot of uh, things and practices that we now consider for granted in the field of bronchoscopy and perhaps endoscopy, such as proper documentation, quality control, training of the staff. Um, these are actually ideas that Dr. Jackson not only introduced, but also uh, popularized. And he also wrote the first textbook of uh, uh, bronchology. Uh, another famous student of Dr. Killian was Dr. Kubo from uh, Japan, who uh, uh, learned bronchoscopy from Dr. Killian and brought it to Japan. And as we know that Japan is a large center of bronchoscopy, and many of the um, uh, companies that, that uh, manufacture bronchoscopes are now based in Japan. So these are two famous students of Dr. Killian. Uh, for a long period of time, for many decades, uh, rigid bronchoscopy was really the only way to access the airway uh, until 1968 when Dr. Shigeru Ikeda from uh, Japan developed the first flexible bronchoscope. Uh, here he is introducing his first uh, flexible bronchoscope. He uh, uh, developed it in um, working with the Olympus, and we have the uh, picture of the first bronchoscope, the flexible bronchoscopes. 
And the development of flexible bronchoscopy in 1968 was a large development in the field of bronchology because it allowed many uh, other um, modalities to be introduced, such as transbronchial biopsies, BALs, um, laser therapy, and, and whatnot. So this famous picture is the one that popularized the notion that bronchoscopy has to be done with the left hand because Dr. Ikeda was left-handed, and Olympus developed the scope for him. But uh, this, this picture is probably the basis for that myth. Uh, here we have uh, Dr. Ikeda with Dr. Dumont from uh, France, who was the first one to uh, introduce uh, stents in the airways. Uh, we still use Dumont scopes and Dumont uh, airway stents. So here we have two giants of modern bronchology uh, together. And so um, because of the hard work and sacrifice and research of all these uh, great people, uh, bronchoscopy has now advanced and a modern, a modern um, bronchoscopy suite um, may have all of these equipments, obviously not cl uh, cluttered up like this, but uh, you can well imagine that bronchology has uh, become a very advanced and almost a subspec uh, subspecialty within uh, pulmonary medicine. Uh, so this is a brief historic perspective. Uh, let's move on to some of the advancements uh, in uh, bronchoscopy. Uh, so we will first focus on diagnostic bronchoscopy and we'll look at the um, navigation platforms that are available for pulmonary nodules. Pulmonary nodule is a very common problem in primary, uh, primary care medicine as well as uh, uh, pulmonary medicine. And in our part of the country, because of histoplasma, uh, because of high rates of smoking, we see a lot of pulmonary nodules in patients who are not the best candidates for surgery because of emphysema or other comorbidities. So uh, management of pulmonary nodules becomes quite challenging. So this is a very common clinical scenario a CT scan performed that shows a uh, somewhat of a subsolid a left upper lobe a spiculated nodule that more or less sits in the center of the lung. And there's some uh, surrounding emphysema, so the patient is probably a smoker or a former smoker. And so the problem is, uh, what do you do with this nodule? Should you follow it? Uh, it looks very concerning for malignancy. Uh, you can access it uh, percutaneously, but the uh, nodule is in the center of the lung, so you'll have to go through a lot of lung tissue to get to the nodule, which increases the risk of uh, pneumothorax. Um, the surgeons can go and cut it out, but we don't know what the lung function of this patient is. Maybe the patient cannot tolerate a lobectomy, and because the nodule is quite central, uh, the only way that a surgeon can know what it is is after a lobectomy uh, and a wedge resection may not be possible. So these are very common uh, challenges and oftentimes uh, we are left with uh, a way to, uh, to, to uh, uh, figure out how to get to this nodule. As you can see between the trachea and the nodule, there are, there's lung tissue, but there's also multiple generations of airways which bring their own challenges. So what are the common challenges that we face when we are thinking about bronchoscopy and sampling of pulmonary nodules? This is a slide that will serve as the basis of uh, the next several slides because many of the uh, advancements in diagnostic bronchoscopy for pulmonary nodules are trying to address these particular uh, challenges. Um, so I will, I will focus on this slide for a few minutes. Uh, so the size of the lesion and location of the lesion, I think these are easy to understand even for people who do not perform bronchoscopy. The smaller the nodule, the farther out it is in the lung, the more difficult it becomes to um, access the nodule. You also have to keep the anatomy of the tracheobronchial tree in mind. Uh, airways are usually tortuous, and the tracheobronchial tree is a 23-generation uh, structure uh, with the trachea being a generation zero. So between the trachea and the pulmonary nodule, there are several generations of airways. And our standard bronchoscopes can only go up to about fifth to sixth, maybe seventh generation. And with the camera, you can look uh, beyond up to maybe about eight, nine generations. So you can really see about a third of the tracheobronchial tree with standard bronchoscopy, while most of the pulmonary pathology happens to be beyond it. Uh, the Le the relation of the lesion to the airway is also important. So if the lesion is um, 
uh, in series with the airways. You introduce the sampling instrument through the airway and it goes straight to the lesion. So that's an easier situation. But if it sits eccentric or right next to the airway, then it's almost like you're traveling on a road, but the house happens to be off-road. And so uh, oftentimes uh, you, you can introduce your sampling uh, instrument, but it's, it stays in the airway while the lesion happens to be right next to it. So it becomes difficult to access it. And this is, uh, this is an area of uh, great interest and some of the newer technologies are trying to address this problem. Uh, the lungs obviously have some very important organs around it, such as large blood vessels, the heart, uh, the pleura. Uh, patients often have emphysematous blebs and bullae. So we have to keep that in mind to avoid complications. Uh, our scopes are limited. They are rigid structures. Uh, our sampling tools are rigid structures. They don't often make the sharp bends and turns that are often required to access these uh, nodules. Uh, in the bronchoscopy data, uh, lesions that are in the apical segments of the lungs, sort of high up in the lung, um, often are difficult to get. Um, and that's why historically the uh, yield has been lower in the apical segments, but this is again uh, an area that is being addressed by some of the advancements in diagnostic bronchoscopy. Um, respiratory motion, uh, the lungs are moving um, when the patients are undergoing bronchoscopy and that movement of the lungs can actually move the nodule quite a lot. And this is a phenomenon called CT body divergence. And this is a, a very important concept uh, in modern bronchoscopy, something that uh, we are now starting to realize, uh, and that's why I put a little star next to it. So we will, talk, we will be talking about CT body divergence and how this is being addressed. And then the human factors, obviously, uh, bronchoscopy, uh, the bronchoscopists uh, have their level of uh, skill, training, and expertise. Uh, when, you, when you talk to bronchoscopists, they all think that they're equally awesome, uh, but uh, that's not really the case. Uh, some are less awesome than others. Um, so just to think about the size and uh, location of the nodule, this is a study from 2000 looking at just fluoroscopy guided bronchoscopic biopsy, which is how routine uh, biopsies are done in, in many places. So as you can see, uh, with, with a small lesion such as two centimeter, uh, the overall yield with fluoroscopy guided uh, biopsy is about 23%. And as the lesion increases in size, and goes to a mass level, which is more than three centimeters, the yield tends to increase. But oftentimes when we are asked to biopsy nodules, they're, they're quite small, uh, less than 2.5. And um, when you look at the location of the nodule, so this is the central third of the lung field, this is the middle third, and then the peripheral third, um, you can see that the more peripheral you go, your yield starts to decrease from 82% to down to 53%. So when you combine the size and location, uh, you can imagine that a small lesion located in the periphery of the lung uh, would be very difficult to get to. And this is from the same study. Uh, the numbers are small, but I think these are easier to understand for even for non-bronchoscopists. So the yield is quite low when you're uh, accessing the small uh, lesions in the periphery of the lung. Uh, let's talk about CT body divergence uh, because this is a concept that uh, often is difficult to, uh, to comprehend for people who don't do bronchoscopy. The rest of the factors that we went through, I think, are easier. So when patients get a CT scan, they are holding their breaths uh, in full inspiration. So the CT scans are done uh, at TLC or total lung capacity. Um, so uh, these patients uh, come to us with a CT scan and we look at the nodule and we say, well, this is, you know, it's in the upper lobe or the lower lobe or the right middle lobe. But when we are doing bronchoscopy, the patients are spontaneously breathing. And so the lung volumes are much lower. Uh, when we do bronchoscopy, the patients are breathing at a lower lung volume compared to where the uh, CT scan was done. So because of the change in lung volume, the position of the nodule also changes. Uh, we are basing our decision on where to access the nodule based on a static film, whereas when we're doing the bronchoscopy, the patients are actively breathing. Um, so this is a study where um, they looked at the position of the nodule. So this is pre-procedure, this is left upper lobe. So in the pre-procedural CT, 
it was right here, but uh, during the procedure, it had moved uh, more laterally. And so if you're accessing a two centimeter nodule that's moving around one to two centimeter in any direction, uh, it's a moving target. And so it becomes difficult often to uh, access the nodule. Another factor is that when patients are intubated for uh, these advanced bronchoscopies, they can immediately develop atelectasis. This is a picture before and immediately after intubation. And as you can see, there's uh, atelectasis in the bases, which not only changes the volume of the lung, but that atelectasis can also hide a small lesion that we're trying to get to. And uh, with our uh, advanced techniques, such as ultrasound, it becomes difficult to find the nodule when the, the lung around it is collapsed. Uh, Dr. Alex Chen from WashU did a study, a retrospective study of 85 homey lesions and showed that um, with inspiration, they can move around 17 millimeters, which may not seem like a lot, but when you're going for small nodules, uh, these nodules can actually be 1.5 to 2 centimeters, and if they're moving around in any direction, uh, it becomes difficult. Those lesions that were closer to the diaphragm uh, obviously tend to move a lot more than those that are in the upper lobes, and size and distance from the pleura did not uh, impact movement in this particular study. So what are the uh, currently available um, instruments that we commonly use to uh, find these nodules and biopsy them. Uh, this is a radial endobronchial ultrasound probe. Uh, it's a high frequency ultrasound probe that uh, rotates at 360 degrees. So we can introduce it through the bronchoscope and uh, find our nodule. There's a picture of uh, a nodule with the probe in the middle and the, the nodule is around it. So this is a very useful instrument which we use uh, very routinely. Uh, it's easy, easy to use, but the downside is that it, it is not steerable. So for us to find the nodule, we have to know our anatomy and know which particular lobe, segment, and subsegment to introduce this probe in. Uh, we have also virtual bronchoscopy, where uh, the computer generates a virtual 3D view of the tracheobronchial tree, and it gives us a path to the lesion. And when we do bronchoscopy, the virtual view can be uh, superimposed on the actual bronchoscopic view. And so we can almost follow a path to the lesion. And this virtual bronchoscopy uh, can be uh, incorporated with fluoroscopy so that you get a, a sort of a path on the uh, fluoroscopy screen and you can align your bronchoscope with this path. And uh, this is called augmented fluoroscopy. And so fluoroscopy is a 2D view. We can't really tell anteroposterior, and so often uh, having this kind of a path can help us at least know that we are uh, in the neighborhood of the lesion. Um, electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy is uh, uh, it's had it's been around for about 20 years now. This system uh, by SuperD is what we use here at the university and at the VA. It's been around for 20 years. It's it gone through many different upgrades and modifications. Um, and uh, the electromagnetic uh, navigation bronchoscopy essentially works by creating an electromagnetic field around the patient and then tracking the position of an electromagnetic sensor that's introduced through the bronchoscope within that electromagnetic field in relation to some fixed uh, landmarks within the tracheobronchial tree. So it's essentially like a GPS system. Here you have a typical screen of the uh, navigation uh, software. So there's a nodule right here in the coronal, sagittal, and axial view. And here's our probe. And so we can follow a path and uh, align ourselves in all three planes and uh, access the nodule. Uh, so this is a common technique that we use. This is one uh, software that's been around for about 20 years. Uh, the other one is by Varan Medical, which has been around for about 10 years, uh, more or less, and essentially works on the same principle. Uh, both of these have their pros and cons, but uh, the underlying uh, rationale is the same. So these are some of the instruments that we commonly use, and they can be combined together uh, and, and sometimes give us a better yield. Um, this is a view of uh, augmented fluoroscopy, uh, where the CT scan can actually be superimposed on a fluoroscopy screen. And so you get not just a uh, static picture, but also a moving picture. I hope the uh, viewers can see the, the movement of the nodule. You have a nodule up here, and as you can see, uh, there's a path that is lined up. 
uh, to the nodule, but with each movement, uh, there is movement of the nodule. And so by watching this screen, you can actually time your biopsy and perhaps get a better yield. So these are some of the technologies that have been around for quite some time. Now, they all are wonderful and very helpful. Uh, having said that, in the real world, they still have their limitations. Uh, this is a study from 2012 where a number of studies on guided bronchoscopy were looked at. Uh, and as you can see, virtual bronchoscopy, electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy, uh, guide sheet with radial endobronchial ultrasound, ultra-thin bronchoscopes, and uh, radial endobronchial ultrasound without the guide sheet. All of these have been tried. Uh, I think you can uh, look at this uh, diagnostic yield and, and see that most, most of these modalities give us about a 70% yield. So we are stuck at that number. About a third of the cases uh, tend to be non-diagnostic. And the newer advancements in bronchoscopy are really addressing that last 30%, trying to take this 70% into the 80 and perhaps the 90% range, keeping in mind that there's always going to be some false negative. Um, these are some of the newer ideas that are uh, coming up and may become uh, part and parcel of routine bronchoscopy. As I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, when we do bronchoscopy, we can only travel through the airways. And sometimes the, the lesions happen to be outside the airway. And so we have to go um, off track. Uh, there's a technique called transprankable nodule access, where you can actually puncture a little hole in the small airway and then um, access the lesion. So uh, that gives us uh, access to the uh, nodules or, or the masses that are outside the airways. Um, this was a study done uh, in Germany in 2015 using the Archimedes uh, virtual bronchoscopy system. Uh, the first thing that this uh, system will uh, give you is on a screen, it can give you a point where you can make a hole then put a small balloon to dilate that hole, and then um, uh, further advance a guide sheet through that hole to the lesion outside the airway, and then uh, introduce your sampling instrument, such as a forcep, to go outside the airway and access the nodule. Now, this uh, sounds like a terrible idea to, to puncture the, the airway and go into the lung parenchyma, uh, but there are softwares that can actually tell you where the uh, danger zones are, meaning where the main vessels are. And multiple studies have been done, and actually they show that the diagnostic yields uh, can be improved even up to 100%, and the risk of complications such as bleeding and pneumothorax is, uh, is fairly low. Uh, so these uh, instruments that allow us to go beyond the airways are now commercially available, and we have them here and you know, on uh, when, when needed, we can actually um, access nodules that are outside the airway. Um, the other exciting development in uh, this area is the uh, cone beam CT guided bronchoscopy. As I mentioned, uh, CT body divergence, the movement of the nodule with respiration is a big challenge for bronchoscopists who are going after small nodules. Uh, fluoroscopy only gives us a 2D view. Uh, it cannot tell us uh, if we are right in, in the lesion, and it cannot tell us uh, the relation between our sampling instrument and the nodule during respiration. So cone beam provides us uh, with a 3D view, uh, and that can tell us uh, very exactly if our sampling instrument is in the middle of the lesion. And uh, this is a paper from Dr. Pritchett, uh, who has performed many cone beam CT guided bronchoscopies and is considered a uh, an expert in this field. Uh, so this is an exciting uh, development and uh, will be uh, uh, coming to University Hospital uh, fairly soon. Multiple studies have been done on cone beam CT uh, guided bronchoscopy. The yields um, are variable, uh, perhaps reflecting the expertise of the bronchoscopies and uh, the kinds of lesions that are accessed. But as you can see, uh, the yield uh, can be increased up to 90%. Um, and so this is uh, an area which can allow us to uh, access peripheral nodules, nodules that uh, move around quite a lot with respiration. Um, and so um, hopefully will be, um, be, will be becoming a part and parcel of a routine bronchology. 
So when existing technology, uh, despite its promise, does not give us the results that we desire, and we are also limited by our uh, human shortcomings, we, we come to a moment of thought. Uh, where do we go from there? Well, how, how can we go beyond that 70, 80 percent and go into the 90 percent range? Because um, the uh, cost of non-diagnostic testing is quite a lot. Some of these patients have uh, poor lung function, and so they cannot tolerate multiple procedures and um, are often not a candidate for surgical resection. So when we are uh, at that uh, point, what do you do? Um, I think some of you have guessed it right. Uh, we bring in the robots. Uh, so robotic bronchoscopy is uh, no longer a myth. Uh, robotic bronchoscopy is now commercially available. These are two robotic bronchoscopy systems uh, that have been around for uh, just a few years. Uh, on the left, you have the Monarch platform uh, by Oris, and uh, on the right, you have the Ion endoluminal robotic system by Intuitive. These two systems are now available. They both have their, uh, you know, strengths and weaknesses. And uh, the Oris uh, or the Monarch robotic bronchoscopy system has uh, come to a place near you. Uh, as of last month, a uh, Jewish hospital became the first hospital in Kentucky to perform robotic bronchoscopy. Our young uh, cardiothoracic surgeon, Dr. Matt Black, was the first uh, bronchoscopist to perform robotic bronchoscopy in Kentucky. So we are very excited about this uh, development, uh, and I hope that this program uh, will be instrumental in uh, serving our patients with uh, lung cancer, with lung nodules, and we hope to uh, have this program grow very fast. So congratulations uh, to everybody uh, in the university system. It's been a diff difficult year, but uh, it's not all uh, doom and gloom. So congratulations. and. Uh, uh, well done, Dr. Black. All right, so uh, this is the Monarch system that is now available at the Jewish Hospital. As you can see, it's almost uh, like playing a video game. And so all those years of playing video games can finally uh, help. Uh, this is a very small caliber, uh, easily maneuverable uh, bronchoscope that can make tight bends and turns, and more importantly, can maintain that turn uh, uh, as you are sampling uh, the lesion. Often what happens in uh, bronchoscopy is when we introduce our uh, sampling instrument, because the instruments are rigid, they tend to uh, move the guide sheath, and so at the, at the last moment when we are about to take a sample, um, our uh, guide sheath moves away from the lesion and it becomes a, uh, it becomes a difficult situation. But in this particular case, we can uh, maintain those tight turns. Um, and use our instruments. As you can see, this is an FNA needle that can be passed through the bronchoscope. And there are other instruments such as biopsy forceps. Uh, oftentimes it's thought that bronchoscopy can only provide a fine needle aspirate, but that's not true. We, we can uh, take large biopsies as well. So this is the uh, platform that is now available. Uh, there is one uh, prospective study recently published uh, looking at the diagnostic yield uh, and the feasibility. So using this uh, platform and the radial endobronchial ultrasound, about 96% of the lesions uh, could be accessed and the yield was about 80%. Uh, and the average procedure time was about 50 minutes, which in the field of advanced bronchoscopy is actually very reasonable. Uh, the pneumothorax rate was still uh, very low, about 3.7%. So um, very exciting development. And there is a large uh, prospective trial that is going on, uh, and uh, this will provide more results and hopefully will uh, help advance the field of robotic bronchoscopy. Uh, as far as the other robotic bronchoscopy platform is concerned, ION, uh, there's one study uh, that showed that about 96.6% .6 of the lesions can, could be accessed. The diagnostic yield was close to 80%, uh, but for malignancies, it was actually 90%, which is uh, tremendous. And there's another prospective trial looking at this particular uh, robotic bronchoscopy platform enrolling 360 patients. So there's a lot of work that is going on, and uh, hopefully robotic bronchoscopy uh, will be becoming um, an important part of uh, dealing with lung cancers and lung nodules, especially in uh, tertiary care centers such as ours. So this is some of the exciting developments uh, in the field of uh, diagnostic bronchoscopy for 
uh, lung nodules. Uh, let's shift gears and move towards uh, the therapeutic parts of bronchoscopy, and we will focus on benign lung disease, such as obstructive lung disease, and then uh, finally malignant uh, lung disease. So let's talk about some of the bronchoscopic therapies for, obstruct for obstructive lung disease. Um, bronchial thermoplasty has been around for several years. It was uh, approved by FDA in 2010. Uh, bronchial thermoplasty is a bronchoscopic therapy for poorly controlled severe persistent asthma. And what it involves is passing a small catheter that applies low voltage current uh, to the airways and ablates the smooth uh, muscles of the airways that tend to uh, hypertrophy in asthma. And this is done over a series of uh, bronchoscopic procedures about three weeks apart. Uh, so we are able to perform these uh, procedures here at university and um, are often a referral center for patients with uh, severe asthma. This is the AIR-2 trial, which was instrumental in uh, getting bronchial thermoplasty approved uh, through the FDA. This was a multicenter randomized double blind sham controlled clinical trial with uh, 288 patients. And what it showed is that bronchial thermoplasty improved uh, asthma-related uh, quality of life questionnaire, uh, decreased the uh, severe asthma exacerbations, decreased uh, emergency room visits, and uh, decreased the number of missed days from work and school. And uh, a follow-up study uh, published in 2013 showed that these uh, reductions in exacerbations and emergency room visits were maintained at five-year follow-up. So uh, bronchial thermoplasty is now um, uh, a very routine part of advanced asthma care. Um, this is uh, something that I think our medical uh, students and, and medical residents have now become aware of. They've been taking care of some of our uh, patients after bronchoscopic lung volume reduction for emphysema. Um, I want to thank them for their hard work and uh, uh, for taking care of uh, our patients. Uh, this is an exciting uh, field for patients with emphysema. And personally, for me, it's very uh, not only enjoyable, but also very satisfying that now we have something more than just inhalers to offer to our patients with advanced emphysema. Um, there are many different devices that have been tried or are under development and testing for bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about um, the science behind it and what are the different uh, interventions available. So as we know that in emphysema uh, and COPD, hyperinflation of the lungs uh, and air trapping is a uh, big problem. Uh, as uh, you have air trapping, uh, the respiratory and chest wall movement uh, is impaired, which leads to shortness of breath and decreases quality of life and exercise performance. It can impair cardiac function. And as you can see in this graph, uh, hyperinflation uh, by itself is an independent predictor of mortality in uh, COPD. Uh, the landmark National Emphysema Treatment Trial, which uh, uh, was done uh, using surgical lung volume reduction, um, it did show that you can improve long-term survival uh, in these patients uh, and lung function and their quality of life and decrease the frequency of exacerbation. But uh, this came at a price. Uh, the mortality was high. There was significant morbidity even in patients who responded. Uh, and, and the patients who uh, responded was a very small and specific uh, group uh, in, the, um, in the patients who were enrolled. And uh, also there's uh, issues with access and cost. Uh, not every uh, center is able to provide this treatment. So the, the idea behind bronchoscopic lung volume reduction is to achieve the same results with less invasive and less risky interventions. Um, so that we have uh, one-way valves or coils that can help us uh, target a lobe that is hyperinflated and cause atelectasis. There's biologic lung volume reduction or vapor ablation that uh, causes destruction and remodeling of the uh, uh, hyperinflated uh, lobe. And then there are other techniques that have been tried uh, with transpleural ventilation or stenting, which I'm not going to cover in this uh, particular talk. Um, this is the uh, landmark LIBERATE trial, uh, which we were part of in, in, at this center, uh, which uh, got Zephyr endobronchial valves by pulmonics uh, approved through the FDA. These are patients with 
uh, heterogeneous emphysema and air trapping with uh, a residual volume of at least uh, more than 175% predicted, where 120 uh, and less is considered um, normal. So these are patients with air trapping. Uh, these are one-way valves that are placed bronchoscopically uh, in the target lobe, and they allow air to exit from that lobe, uh, but don't allow air to enter. And so over time, that hyperinflated lobe uh, gets deflated, which improves the uh, lung volume, improves the function of the diaphragm, and essentially achieves the same results. Uh, these are the results from the um, LIBERATE trial. As you can see, FEV1 uh, greater than 15% or greater than 12%. Uh, residual volume, St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire, uh, six-minute walk test, uh, MMRC a dyspnea scale, the BOAT index, which is another important index looking at uh, the, uh, the function and uh, uh, survival of COPD patients, and the total, volume, uh, uh, total lung volume reduction were all achieved uh, at very high numbers uh, uh, compared to those in the control. Um, and uh, the main complication, as uh, some of our uh, residents and medical staff would know, is pneumothorax. So but there was a 26 percent uh, risk of uh, pneumothorax, uh, which is well known to the patients and the physicians uh, who take care of these patients. So this is something that we talk to them about, and that's why these patients are put in the hospital for about three days following uh, uh, this intervention. And it is believed that the pneumothorax happens because of rapid deflation of the lung and compensatory overinflation of the adjacent lobe, which can uh, sometimes rupture a bleb. Um, and the risk is about 26%. But the good thing is that even patients who have a pneumothorax, they eventually tend to respond at the, at the same rate as those who did not. So it does not prevent patients from improving. Uh, when you compare this, the Results of this intervention with the NET trial, you can, say, you can see that the improvement in FEV1, residual volume, six-minute walk test, and St. George's respiratory questionnaire are all comparable compared to the surgical lung volume reduction. Um, and obviously, it comes at a much lower uh, risk of complication of respiratory failure, pneumonia, and mortality. So this is uh, something that we've been uh, performing since August of last year, and we are actually one of the um, biggest centers of it in, in, in the nation, uh, certainly in the top five or 10 percent. This is the other uh, endobronchial valve, which is also available. Uh, this is by Spiration. It uh, essentially works on the same principle, but a little different design. Um, and uh, this, the trial for this was the IMPROVE trial, uh, enrolling about 220 patients, uh, which um, showed that these patients also uh, improved their FEV1 at six and 12 months. And uh, all the secondary outcomes were also improved, including air trapping uh, and dyspnea scores. Uh, again, pneumothorax was the main adverse event. Um, so there are now two uh, valves available for bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. There are other uh, techniques that are under development, uh, uh, treatment, uh, and uh, uh, this, this kind of treatment is uh, still not widely available, certainly not in the US. Uh, we have these lung volume reduction coils, which are made of nitinol. They can be placed bronchoscopically in the target lobe, and as they are placed, they have a, a memory, so they contract and basically take the lobe down. Um, this uh, trial is uh, going on, and hopefully this will be approved. These are uh, good interventions for patients who have uh, more homogeneous emphysema. And uh, this is something that uh, probably will be available in the next several years. Other <laughs> treatments that are being looked at is bronchos, uh, bronchial thermal vapor ablation using superheated steam or uh, biologic lung volume reduction using a biologic glue made, made of fibrin and thrombin. And the whole idea is to uh, treat the target lobe, the destroyed uh, hyperinflated lobe, cause inflammation, and finally, uh, atelectasis and uh, uh, improvement in air trapping. So these uh, therapies are under trial, um, and we, we will be looking forward to having some of these available in the near future. Um, there are two other um, therapies that are now available for patients uh, with COPD without hyperinflation. They're still in the, the testing phase. Uh, total lung denervation uh, is something that is being looked at. Um, this is a bronchoscopic therapy that uses a radiofrequency ablation catheter 
to ablate the pulmonary branches of vagus nerve in the bilateral mainstem bronchi. Uh, and the underlying rationale is that cholinergic act hyperactivity uh, can increase mucus secretion, increase hyperresponsiveness of the airways, which leads to airflow limitation, air trapping, and hence COPD exacerbation. So re by reversing these processes, you can improve patients' symptoms. Um, several studies have been done. Uh, Preclinical trials have shown that you can uh, use this catheter to disrupt vagal nerves and uh, produce the, the sensory motor changes that you expect. Uh, the IPS1 trial showed that uh, the bronchodilation that you get with this particular intervention is equal to anticholinergic therapy with inhalers. And another trial showed that uh, co combining both of these therapies actually achieves higher results than either therapy alone. Um, this has been tried in humans and uh, uh, has been found to be safe and feasible. And uh, so uh, this uh, phase three trial, airflow three trial will be uh, going on and we will actually be participating in it. So we are one of the centers uh, for this airflow three trial looking at bronchoscopic uh, total lung denervation for patients with the COPD. Uh, who may not be candidates for bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. Uh, the other therapy that is available for patients with COPD, but the chronic bronchitis type, the uh, patients who, who tend to present more with cough and sputum, is a bronchial rheoplasty uh, using a catheter uh, in the main stem bronchi uh, and non-thermal ablation therapy. We can uh, ablate the airway mucosa and the goblet cells which helps uh, improve uh, patients' uh, goblet cell hyperplasia scores, uh, but more importantly, the, the clinical scores such as the COPD assessment uh, test score and the St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire. Um, and so this trial uh, by Gala Therapeutics um, will be starting in the next uh, few months, and we actually uh, will be one of the centers for this trial as well. So. Um, we are very excited that we are able to provide not just lung transplant, but also surgical lung volume uh, reduction uh, therapy, and also bronchoscopic lung volume reduction with endobronchial valves. And we will be participating in these two trials, looking at total lung denervation and bronchial rheoplasty. Um, Dr. Alan Ramirez, who is our lung transplant uh, director, um, has built a very nice uh, multidisciplinary group uh, that involves uh, uh, myself, Dr. Rivas Perez, uh, and uh, Dr. Va Victor Van Berkel from the th thoracic surgery. So this will be a program for advanced COPD, and patients can be referred to this program, and uh, they will be evaluated for all these treatments and trials. So we are very excited that we'll be able to provide um, uh, these advanced therapies to our COPD patients. All right, so uh, last few minutes, I just want to introduce this idea of uh, what I would consider the final frontier for advanced bron bronchoscopy. Uh, as we have seen, there are multiple advanced navigation platforms that are being looked at to, to biopsy nodules that are far out in the lung, that are much smaller. And what is the rationale behind it? Uh, well, the idea is that if you can catch lung cancer early, you can treat it uh, better with better survival. And so the, uh, the future could be that the patients will be referred for these nodules and using advanced bronchoscopy, they will be sampled. And once the pathologist tells us on site that uh, this nodule is malignant, several different bronchoscopic uh, therapies can be provided uh, to ablate that cancer. So this will be one-stop shop for many patients. Uh, this is an entire topic by itself. Uh, but just to introduce this idea, uh, bronchoscopic radiofrequency ablation has been tried. And in one trial, uh, the local control for stage one, stage two lung cancer was 83%. A median progression-free survival was 35 months, and five-year survival was 61%. Uh, percent. And uh, the, this, this can be a potential treatment for patients who are not candidates for surgery or don't want radiation. Um, Micro, uh, bronchoscopic microwave ablation is being uh, tested in several trials. Uh, photodynamic therapy has been around for many decades, um, but is now being tried uh, in the peripheral nodules. This uses the photochemical effect of light. Uh, a photosensitizing uh, chemical is uh, injected in the patient and tends to reside within 
the cancer cells and using a non-thermal laser, that chemical is activated and uh, ends up uh, killing cells. Uh, cryoablation with the liquid nitrogen or liquid nitrous oxide is being tried in the peripheral lung. Brachytherapy for, has been around for endoluminal uh, cancers, uh, but now it's being tried bronchoscopically for peripheral lesions. And finally, a bronchial thermal vapor ablation using superheated steam is being tested. So as you can see, there are multiple therapies that are being tried and tested uh, and hopefully will be available in the next several years. And by combining the advancements in, in advanced uh, diagnostic bronchoscopy with advancements in advanced therapeutic bronchoscopy, I think the future of bronchology and thoracic oncology is, is looking very bright. But uh, nothing comes without a cost. Um, all these uh, platforms are good, but they come with, uh, with their own challenges. Obviously, they're expensive, so the capital cost will be something that will need to be looked at in the future. Uh, the cost effectiveness of these interventions uh, will, be, will need to be evaluated. Uh, reimbursement for hospitals and physicians uh, will have to be looked at. Uh, bronchoscopy is no longer a 10, 15, 20 minute procedure, especially if you're talking about advanced bronchoscopy in patients with multiple comorbidities. Uh, it's, it's not unusual for advanced bronchoscopies to go on for, a year, for uh, an hour or you know, close to an hour. We'll have to look at the usefulness of these uh, instruments. We don't want to have expensive toys. We want to have uh, useful interventions. Uh, the safety of these uh, therapies, especially the advanced therapeutics, uh, will have to be looked at. And once uh, these therapies are available, we'll have to think about how to train the bronchoscopists, how to maintain uh, their training, how to determine their certification, maintenance of certification, how to train our, our fellows, how to standardize these procedures, uh, how to determine who's, who's competent to do, do these procedures and who's not. And then we'll have to uh, continue to generate um, robust clinical data to justify um, the cost and use of these instruments. Um, there is now a interventional pulmonary outcomes group that includes interventional pulmonologists from many different centers uh, who have uh, come together and they are performing wonderful prospective trials uh, looking at advanced bronchology. So we are excited about it. So I will leave you uh, with this uh, view of the bronchoscope from the future. Um, natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgery, uh, the concept has been around essentially to remove or resect organs without making an incision. So it's very possible that sometime in the future, the bronchoscopes will allow us to go in, uh, biopsy a lesion, uh, and treat it by resecting it uh, with the same instrument. Um, so who knows what the future holds, uh, but we are certainly on a good track. And for those uh, students and residents who are thinking about pulmonology, I would uh, I would want you to think about uh, all these developments and uh, how this can impact your career and your choice of uh, subspecialization. So I think that's all I have, and uh, thank you very much again, and I hope I've been able to at least give you some idea uh, of where bronchoscopy stands and how bronchoscopy has become its own little uh, subspecialty within pulmonary and critical care medicine. Thank you very much. Outstanding, Dr. Galhar. And uh, if anyone has a question, you can unmike, unmute your mic and ask a question, or if you would like, you can type it in the chat area and I can read it to Dr. Galhar. Do anybody have any questions today? Yes, Dr. Gohar, uh, thank you for that great overview. I'm wondering if you might be able to tell us, given the importance of steroids and antibiotics for the management of many of these patients, how much is actually known about the contribution of things like the microbiome and changes in those dynamics or these exacerbations and progressions of disease over time? Um, well, it's a good question. Well, I, I, I guess it, uh, I'm not uh, completely aware that this has been looked at in terms of lung cancer or if the data is that robust. Um, we use steroids quite a lot in obviously our many pulmonary diseases. Um, but to, to my knowledge, uh, the, the data with steroids in, in benign lung disease, um, 
such as COPD is, is fairly robust. I mean, it tends to reduce the uh, duration of uh, your exacerbations. But um, are you referring to any particular lung condition or is it in general? So there's several that I'm referring to, certainly with regard to exacerbations of COPD, uh, mm -hmm. for which there's at least preliminary evidence that dynamics of bacterial populations plays a role. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, damage to the lung does as well, but whether this damage is because of those changes in population over time or secondary to that is unknown. And yes. I don't know how much we know about the dynamics of these populations and how much good or harm, therefore, we do with any specific type of antibiotics. If there's like there's emerging in the GI literature now, dominant mm -hmm. communities of organisms that lead towards a predisposition to an inflammatory phenotype. Is that mm -hmm. also true in the lung, setting people up for long-term issues with uh, yeah. you know, dynamics that not only lead to worsening COPD, but mm -hmm. because of the contribution of chronic inflammation to a malignant change, does that also yeah. add to that potential risk for people? Um, so, uh, yeah, to my knowledge, uh, we don't have that, that information. Now, back in the 80s, Dr. Antonison uh, did studies looking at COPD exacerbation and the role of antibiotics, and he clearly showed that antibiotics reduce the duration of exacerbation. And then further studies also, also showed that antibiotics that, uh, that treat atypical organisms, such as uh, fluoroquinolones and macrolides, are the treatment of choice. So. Uh, in our COPD population, Morixella, Haemophilus are common organisms. So when we think about patients who are um, declining in terms of their lung function, uh, we do tend to keep these organisms in mind. I think Dr. Sanjay Sethi from Rochester has done studies looking at the microbiology of sputum in um, COPD, and he has shown that as your FEV1 declines, the, the incidence of resistant organisms, gram negatives, particularly pseudomonas goes up. So, so we know that part, that uh, infections, uh, especially with particular organisms, tend to correlate with worsening uh, lung function. Um, and we also know that uh, a non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection is also uh, known to, to happen with higher frequency in patients with COPD. Uh, now, how does that play into uh, the, the malignant, uh, I guess, diseases of the lung? Uh, to my knowledge, that, that area is still uncertain. But with COPD, I think that there is robust data. I certainly agree with you. The point I'm getting to, I guess, is that we know there's a balance between these populations. And what I haven't seen in the literature, as we've seen in the GI literature, is which organisms are, quote, good and help mm -hmm. to prevent the overgrowth of the, quote, bad or infectious or inflammatory causing bacteria. Mm -hmm. You know, we're entering the age now with things like bacteriophages where we can manipulate specific populations of bacteria. So is there a yin and yang of these dynamic organisms that we should favor some to prevent the overgrowth of others rather than mm -hmm. wholesale killing with antibiotics? Uh, great question, and uh, I wish I had the answer to it. But uh, I think that there, there are studies happening. At, um, I'm forgetting the, the uh, pulmonologist at IU. I mean, I think he looks at the pulmonary microbiome. And so I'm, I'm, I'm sure these studies are going on. Thanks, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have, would any, anybody else have a question for Dr. Galhar? Again, you can uh, unmute your mic or if you wanted to type it in the chat area, we can read it from there. Dr. Galhar, thank you so much. That was wonderful. <laughs> and, uh, All right, thank you. I'm, and, I'm glad everything worked out. Yes, me too. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I just want to thank everybody who joined us today. And again, thank you to Dr. Galhar and, and then to the pulmonary group and, and, and for a great grand rounds today. And uh, we, will, we will be off for the holidays for the next two weeks. Uh, our next grand rounds will be after the new year on January 7th. And that will be uh, cardiology with that presentation. So uh, Again, we want to wish everybody happy holidays and thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. And again, thank you, Dr. Gauhar. That was awesome. All right. Thank you, Jason. Happy holidays. <clears throat>
All right. Thank you. Same to you. Thanks, everybody.